So by June of 43, we're starting a plan called Operation Cartwheel, involving both Halsey and uh, MacArthur trying to sweep into Rabal. And it's essentially like a cartwheel. It moves in a circular motion. Well, we're going to have Halsey coming up, Solomon's, MacArthur coming out of, out of New Guinea into New Britain, and we're going to knock them out. Remember, the idea is to get to Rabal, but for uh, Halsey, it means jumping island to island all the way up the, pr the process. Let me see if I got it. Oh, I don't have a good map back there. I'm going to go back just a second. I want to pull back my map so you can get a feel for what I'm talking about. So that means moving through the chain of the Solomons. Notice, you start at Guadalcanal. How many more islands do you have to go? One, two, three, four to Bougainville, which is a, pri a primary objective. And then secondly, you've got to get from Bougainville over to New Britain, which is the red sliver over here. That's going to take a while. That's what we're facing. Halsey's got a big task ahead of him. So by November, or well, by October of 43, we are starting to make some momentum. Some of those islands in the Solomons were not as well protected, not as well defended by the Japanese. And Halsey was able to make some great progress, except when he gets up to Bougainville. And Bougainville is a tough one. It's a hard, bad fight there. By November of 1943, we're starting to close in on Rabaul. The pinchers is starting to close. And that's going to start making the difference. Now, what we see here is in July of 43. In the midst of this Pinchers movement, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States decide this is too slow, too costly, takes too much resources. We've got to find a better way to do it. Well, they look at a plan that's advanced by Chester Nimitz, who's been looking at this, and he says if we go straight across, going across, we're going to go through all these little atolls. And we're going to be able to knock out the Japanese because these eight holes are not very big. Maybe in some cases two, three miles long by less than a mile wide. They're very thinly defended by the Japanese. Maybe they only got five, six thousand troops. Most of it's an air base. If we blast them heavily with our fleets, we'll be able to knock them out, send troops in after we blast them heavily and make progress. Well, in theory, that sounds what? Great, you know, superior firepower versus a small island. Well, that doesn't, doesn't really work that way. And what we find is that with even with the new carrier groups, and by this point we have new battleships, new carrier groups, and what's interesting is the, the speed and the firepower that these new ships have. The United States is altered through its naval architecture, battleships. We're not talking about boats that used to get, and I... I know, should use ships or boats. Those are little things out in the lake. Ships that fight within close proximity to each other. That's not the way it works anymore. We have now, with better guns, better weaponry, the idea of naval bombardment, especially on land targets, is going to progress. Guns that are 15 inches and greater. And if you've ever been on a battleship, nobody's on the deck when they open up with some of those things because the vibration and the, the percussion of those guns would sweep you quite literally off the deck. And what we're going to see is in some of these battles, the amount of bombing that will go on is unbelievable. Well, the first objective is the island of Tarawa. Tarawa is an atoll. An atoll is a coral island. It's made entirely almost of coral. Juts out of the sea. Look at how long this thing is. Two miles long. 800 yards wide. That isn't very big. In fact, that's a, that's a map of it. See how big it is? Look what the most prominent feature of this island is. It's a Japanese airstrip. That's an objective because we want to get these atolls because we also want to get our aircraft onto these islands and start 
the process of getting them closer and closer so we can do sustained bombing of Japan. We're using our aircraft, our bombers, and we want to do it with air support from fighters. Remember, fighters are getting better, but they cannot make up the difference because as we had last week, Mr. Hartman telling you, they could go 11 hours, fighters can't go 11 hours. They go a third of, it, of that or less. So that's part of the issue here. <clears throat> now, the fighting on Tarawa is unbelievable. The Japanese have reinforced the position. They have hidden tunnels on the island. And they use tanks and pillboxes to support themselves. Now, there was 2,600 regular troops supplemented by a labor force of Japanese that are about 2,000. Plus, on top of that, they had 1,200 Korean force laborers on this. Remember, the Japanese are not building these reinforced positions by themselves. They take labor that they've gotten from other places and force them to do the work. Now, this is interesting. This is the first time we get to experience that the Japanese are fighting, and they're fighting to death. There is no dropping back. There's no withdrawal. This means everything, because they're not getting off this atoll. They're attacked. This is it for them. We used 35,000 troops to storm this island. Can you imagine 35,000 troops against a force less than 5,000, of which half of that is regular Japanese military? These guys fight tremendously, both the guys, our guys coming on the island, but also look what happens. We almost sustain a casualty rate equal to what? The number of Japanese. Now, is that going to be acceptable going forward? Because these atolls, this is a small atoll. We know that the ones going down the pike are going to be what? Larger, more troops. More troops mean what? More casualties. More Americans coming home dead. What will be the feeling of the public going forward? Now, this gives you an idea in terms of size. That's one of our tapes that we use on Tarawa. That little tank that's on top of it, that was placed there by our Marines as kind of a show and tell. That's a Japanese tape, OK? So this gives you an idea. Technology, firepower, it's all favoring who? US. We can build them faster, we build them bigger, we build them better. That's what the Japanese are facing. And remember, they can't get these things on these islands quick enough because of shipping problems. So they're stuck. What's there is there. If it's not there, you fight with what you have. And a lot of times they're fighting with small arms, and they're fighting from uh, in placed positions. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Island of Saipan, which is a critical point, point, uh, point on this atoll campaign that Nimitz is, is uh, gone to. Now, we have to remember that after Tarawa, we had some great success in the Marshall Islands. Two of those fell very quickly. They were very small. The amount of casualties we took was very minimal. We were kind of almost cocky in a way. This is working until we got to Saipan. Now Saipan, we take our new naval assets, all these great battleships that can shoot fast and hard, and we unleash a torrent of artillery onto this, onto Saipan. Look at how many shells we shot. 165,000 shells. Trouble is, Japanese are dug in very deep, very well. They have emplacements that are all connected. They have a huge mountain that they've burrowed into. And now, as we get closer and closer to the Japanese home islands, the number of Japanese people on these islands increases. Saipan has a huge Japanese civilian population. Again, the word is fight and fight to the death. 
Now, the emperor is getting concerned because he realizes on some of these islands, the lower class Japanese almost seem like they're going to run away when the opportunity comes. That the, the joining the Americans almost seems like a lucrative option. There's some controversy. It's clear today that the decree has been put out by Hirohito himself. The evidence shows this. That he ordered Japanese civilians to fight to the death or to commit suicide. 